Well, please grab a Bible and open up to Revelation chapter 1 and chapter 2. Uh, today we are in chapter 2, looking at verses 18 down to verse 29. Uh, and so we're going to look at those together in just a minute. But I do need to tell you that the first service, it was intense, okay? <laughs> But we had a good time going through Revelation 2. Uh, And so come along the journey with me as we go through uh, these extraordinary verses together. uh, And we open up our hearts to what God has to say to us uh, this morning. We do that every Sunday. um, But in particular today, we need to listen well to what God has to say to us through his word. So in Revelation 2, verses 18 down to verse 29. uh, And as we get into it, I want to begin by telling you how much... Uh, I care about this church. I care about you. Um, You mean a lot to me. Uh, And as I think about that, I know something very, very true about that. And that is that Jesus cares more about the condition of this church than I ever will. His love for you, his love for his church here in Longmont, his love for the big C around the world, the big church, uh, is unparalleled. There's nobody who has enough passion to even come close to how much Jesus actually cares for his church. And so, yes, I love you, I care for you, but you need to understand at a very deep level that Jesus cares and loves you. And he cares so much because uh, he bought us by his blood. That the value of your life means that Jesus gave his life for you. You mean so much. You are valuable beyond what you could ever imagine. And so, yes, I value you, but you are valued by your creator. And if you think about this, we know that Jesus, as I said, is the one who cares more about the condition of the church than any one of us. And the church itself is not a building. Yes, you came into a physical building. We are located here in the corner of Gay Street and 21st. That's where we are physically located. But you are the church. It is God's people gathered together in a particular place, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that is the church. Yes, we have a building we got to take care of and these things, but you are the church. You matter more than any of these things. And as we look at these seven letters that come from Jesus through John to these seven churches, each of them are at different points of their spiritual journey. There's different spiritual conditions, different issues that they're dealing with, uh, different things that they're doing really great at. And so as we look at this, we understand that, that what Jesus is doing through all of these letters is he's wanting to help his church return to a vibrancy and vitality that it once had. That's his intention. He, he wants them to go from the spiritual decline that they're experiencing to kind of reappear in a, in a place where they are vital and they are having vigor in their life and one of the ways that's going to happen is by having a stronger vision of jesus much of the decline i think that we experience in the church is due to a shrinking and shriveled view of jesus but john won't let us go there neither will jesus that that if we're going to have our vigor restored and a restoration of our life with him he must get bigger in our vision and so we started the series back in chapter 1. I want you to, to see these verses again because it helps us understand what I'm saying. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 to 16. I'm going to read these for us because this is John's vision of Jesus that he saw. Verse 12, chapter 1. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Wow! And if that doesn't blow your mind, like let's just read it again, and again, and again, and again, until it gets into your mind. This is the vision that John had of Jesus, and it is very different sometimes than the vision that we have. We have this vision of Jesus being this very shriveled, kind of, kind of the soft guy. 
Which I, maybe he, I'm sure he was a soft guy, but, it, but this vision here that John has says, this guy is not to be messed with. <laughs> he is dominant, and he is commanding, and he has presence. And so in many ways, the strength of our church will be built on this vision of Jesus. Coming to greater alignment. Who is this person that we worship and adore? Who is he and what is he like? It's interesting to note that each of the seven letters that we see in uh, chapter 2 and 3, that there's an aspect of that vision of Jesus that is delivered to those churches. And there's a reason why there's a, that particular part of the vision that is picked up in those letters. Uh, so I want you to see this, the one we're looking at today. Chapter 2, verse 18. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Now compare that then, what I just read a minute ago, chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. His eyes, at the end of verse 14, were like a flame of fire, and his feet were burnished bronze. So you see the parallel, right? This is the vision that John had. Now in the letter to Thyatira, he says, this is the one who's delivering this message to you. This is the one who has eyes like a flame of fire. And his feet are like burnished bronze. What a vision of Jesus. And they emphasize the main point that I want to hit home this morning. And we're going to look at it in a couple different ways. But it is this. That there is nothing secret. There is nothing hidden that Jesus does not see, does not perceive, and does not understand. He has eyes like a flame of fire. Now I want you to see this in verse 23 of chapter 2. In verse 23, after this whole kind of sequence that we're going to walk through together, Jesus says this in verse 23, And all the churches will know what? That I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. Jesus sees everything. There is nothing hidden. There is nothing secret. He perceives all things. He understands all things. He gets it. He has eyes like a flame of fire, which means he sees right through you. Now, that's a little freaky, (laughs) for being honest. I'm not sure I want Jesus to see right through me. (laughs) I like to keep a little part of my life that he doesn't, he doesn't, doesn't have access to. And we do that all the time. These verses and this letter to Thyatira will not allow us to go to the place where we think, well, Jesus does not know what's going on in the privacy of my life and the secret parts that nobody knows. He has eyes like a flame of fire. So let's understand Thyatira just a little bit because this is important. Thyatira was the smallest church of any of the letters. There's seven of them, and some of them are a little more famous, like the one to Ephesus. Church in Ephesus was a well-known church. We have, you know, a whole letter that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesians and Ephesus. There's no other real reference in the Bible except for maybe one time in Acts to Thyatira. It was a small, dinky, little church in a very obscure place. Nobody really knew about it. Kind of off in the backwoods, you could say. They were kind of off the radar, off the grid, (laughs) doing their own thing. There's very little known about Thyatira at all, just in general, just historically, but also in the scriptures. There's not much that we know that is that we could say this is what was going on in Thyatira. Smallest church. And yet one of the most fascinating things is that this is the longest letter. Isn't that interesting? I think it's fascinating. Small little dinky little church <laughs> in the backwoods of nowhere. And yet... Jesus has a lot to say about this church, and a lot to them. Unknown church in an obscure place. Jesus sees and Jesus knows. Sometimes saying, who cares about the little guys? You know, those little churches. Well, Jesus does. Size does not matter. Jesus knows what's going on, no matter how big or how small. And so I think that this letter itself is helping us understand that what happens in Thyatira doesn't stay in Thyatira. <laughs> you catch my drift? <laughs> what happens in Thyatira in the obscure places is very known. And we're sitting here in 2024 reading about a very strange place that no one actually knew about. And we're giving a window into what was going on in them. 
What happened in Thyatira does not stay in Thyatira. Now this reminds us of a very important truth. That you and I, in our personal life, may think we have this little area, this little obscure part of our life that only we have access to. And we can kind of dabble in those areas and we have the only key and we can lock it up and throw the key away and no one really have access to that. We can think that we have hidden places of our lives that nobody knows about and nobody cares. Jesus sees right through that. You see, Thyatira being where it is, kind of off in the distance, is, is proving the point of verse 23. That where there's no obscure places that Jesus does not have access to, he searches hearts, he searches minds, and he knows what is going on in the private parts of our life. Does that freak you out just a little bit? It should. To be quite honest, it should be a little freaky to us that, that there is this person who can see right through us into those areas. It is also a grace. It is also a good thing. But it initially, it can be like a little bit of a shock. The other thing we know about Thyatira, very little, but we do know that they were metal workers. They worked metal. They created metal, like high industrial metal for military. That was what their guild was. That's what they were known for. So when the vision comes here in verse 18 that says, Jesus has feet like burnished bronze, we have to imagine that these giant feet of Jesus, right? And he's kind of stomping into the church. And he's like, I am here, and I know what's going on in all the private and secret areas of your life. And as we see, as we go through this, he, he comes, and if there's no repentance, he's going to crush them. Giant bronzed feet. Now you understand why it's a little intense. <laughs> But as we go through this, we need to see verse 19. Because, yes, Jesus sees right through. And we can kind of feel like we're back on our heels. Like, oh, like, oh okay, a little scary. But what we first see in verse 19 is that Jesus sees, verse 19, a very healthy church. It's not all bad. It's actually really, really good what Jesus sees. And so here's the point. I'm going to make verse 19. We're going to unpack it. That a healthy church will experience healthy growth. So Jesus sees all of the good stuff, eyes of flame of fire, and he gives them this extraordinary compliment. And so there's four characteristics of a healthy church. So I'm going to read for us just verse 19, and then we'll, we'll go through it one verse at a time after that. First, verse 19. He says, I know your works, your love, and faith, and service, and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. This is an extraordinary compliment. So what Jesus sees is a church, this healthy church that is experiencing healthy growth. And there's four characteristics that Jesus says, I know what's going on there, and here's the good stuff. And I, I, you can see them in the verse. I'm just going to make some comments on them, but there are four characteristics. The first one you see it is love. Their affection for Jesus is on high. Like, it's like, Way high. Like their, their meter for like loving Jesus is out the roof. Their love for one another is super high. Like they are like abounding in love together. And that is evidence of the fruit of the Spirit in their church. Fruit of the Spirit is love. And so we could say it's this, this love feast. You might remember from Ephesus in the first letter that the church in Ephesus was really failing in this area. But in Thyatira, they are flying. They have great love. Second, they've got great faith. Uh, you see in the verse there, faith. Faith is a conviction of what they believe. Which means that when he's saying here they have faith, it's, it's beyond just kind of the surface level belief. It is drilled down deep into their life. It's one thing to believe something. That's one thing to have faith in it. To have faith in something means I'm going to lean everything I've got on this thing. I am pouring my whole weight onto this thing that I believe. And so in many ways, 
when that happens, it's an activation of faith that says, I believe it in my mind, but it is now descended into my heart, and then it is changing the way that I live. So when we say we have faith, yes, it involves conviction, but it also involves activation. We're acting on that faith that we have on that belief. Third thing they're excelling at is service. It's this spirit-empowered sacrifice for one another. And the word for service in that verse is the word that we get for deacon. It's a great word. We have great deacons here. A lot of churches have deacons, part of their church fabric. Uh, I love that word deacon because it, it brings up the mind, uh, in my mind, the old character, the old cartoon, the roadrunner. Remember the roadrunner, that old character? He's like, beep, beep, zoom, right? Like he's, that, he's booking it. And I have that in mind because when you think about the word deacon and what they are doing is that there's a need that's met and it's like, zoom. And I have to tell you, Longmont Calvary has the gift of service. Like I, I'm becoming an insider here, been here for two years. We're kind of, I'm like, I'm in, I'm, I'm all in. But my first experience here was that this church, man, it's like roadrunner church. It's awesome. You guys are awesome. Because whenever there's a need that's met, it's like, poof. So awesome to see. So I could say as a church, we are excelling in service. It's awesome. Fourth, perseverance. And they are going in the right direction, and nothing's distracting them. Like, they are just steady. Sometimes we don't think steadiness is something we'd be proud of, but, like, it's good to be steady. Like, just consistent. You know, someone says to you, you know, you're so, you know, you're just so consistent. You're not like, oh, great. <laughs> They're persevering. Great compliments from Jesus. I think if Jesus showed here with those bronze feet, stomped in here, and he stood up here and he said, Long Mount Calvary, I know your love. I know your faith, your service, your perseverance. I'd be like, thank you, Jesus. Because all of those are saying we're becoming like him. And when we spend time with Jesus, we become like him. The church in Thyatira is spending time with Jesus. So they're becoming like him. What a great compliment from Jesus that what he sees is that. They're, they're becoming Christ-like. And one of the coolest things about verse 19 is the very last phrase. And he says this, and that your latter work succeed the first. Isn't that cool? What he's saying is this, that you started in one spot with all these characteristics, but man, you are really making progress. He's saying, yeah, you're good at these things, but from where you started to where you are today, you are changing. You're getting better. You're progressing. And it's so awesome to see this because the church in Thyatira wasn't satisfied with the status quo. They're progressing. They're, they're changing uh, and their character and their quality of what's going on. I got to tell you, if Jesus came to us and said that to us, I'd be like, thank you. Thank you. Because that means God is at work here. So our aim, when we think about church growth and health, is healthy growth. Like, and the characteristics and the qualities that Jesus aims here to identify. A distinctiveness, a distinguishedness from what's going on around the world. Now, that's good stuff. But Jesus also sees some bad stuff. And as typical in the letter, this is what he does. He gives them this great compliment. He says, but there's something else going on. Jesus sees something else. I'm going to read for us verses 20 to 23. Great compliment. Verse 19. Now verse 20. But I have this against you. Did you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols? I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed. And those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works and I will strike her children dead. The irony is this. 
Healthy churches grow, but not all growing churches are healthy. You see, all, all the good stuff going on, all, all of that he just mentioned in verse 19 is so good. It's, it, it's, it's gold, right? But all of that health of that church can be upended by unhealthy growth. Verse 20 to 23 are describing a small pocket of toxicity that is growing in the church that will threaten all the good growth if it's not properly and immediately dealt with. Uh, We know this in our own bodies. That you can be looking healthy on the outside, everything can be looking great, like the outside can be good, but you might have something growing in the inside of your body, cancer cells or something else, that is, it is threatening the health of your whole body. And if that isn't dealt with, your whole body is going to start decaying. Verse 20 to 23 are describing this little pocket of toxicity. You could think, think of like, it's down in the church basement, you could say. It's private. It's in the room or way over that no one knows what's going on, but there's something going on. And if it's not put in check, it's going to destroy the whole church. It's going to derail everything. So so I want to describe this because this is really important to get the context here. Before we get deep into Jezebel, because we need to understand what's going on here, we need to understand that for this church here, as we just said, their meter for love was like super high. But they're going soft on doctrine. They have the opposite problem of the church in Ephesus. The church in Ephesus, it was like high doctrine, but it turned into cold rigidity that that drained the church of love. Love had grown cold. In Thyatira, it's the exact opposite that's happened. Their love was abounding, but their sensitivity to truth is being threatened. And because of that, Jesus says, you're tolerating this woman called Jezebel. So let's talk about Jezebel. I need you to go on a journey with me, okay? Because uh, we need to understand the context here. So travel with me. Be patient as we walk through this. If you remember last week in Pergamum, uh, he mentions Balaam and Balak. And Jesus goes back to Numbers to describe the context of what's happening. Here, when he mentions Jezebel, he's going back to 1 Kings. Verses or chapters about 15 to 18 of 1 Kings. In those chapters in 1 Kings, there's a queen whose name is Jezebel, who's married to King Ahab. Queen Jezebel was not a nice lady. She was nasty, wicked, evil, killing all the prophets of God. If we looked at the history of Jezebel from 1 Kings, the the Queen Jezebel, what we'd understand about her is that she grew up as the daughter of a priest of Baal, B-A-A-L. This is, her, this, is the, this is the home she grew up in. She grew up in a home where her dad was a priest of Baal. Now, Baal worship was full of sensuous and sexual activity. So part of the worship of Baal involved a sensuous nature and sexual exploration. So this is the context in which Jezebel grows up in. So when she gets married to Ahab, this is what she knows. And so what she does in her position of power is that she leads God's people away from the purity of worshiping God and towards the worship of Baal. And you can see some of these stories, and these are incredible stories back in 1 Kings. But that's essentially what's happening with Jezebel. She is sensuous, she is sexual, and she is leading God's people away from the purity of worshiping God. So when Jesus references Jezebel here in Revelation chapter 2, I don't think that this is an actual woman in the church whose name was Jezebel. Now, different commentaries, different theologians think a little bit different about how this plays out. But the word Jezebel was not something you wanted to be called. (laughs) If any of you are having kids right now, like, please don't name your kid Jezebel. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I'll look at you like, what are you doing? Oh, it's cute. It's Jezzy. No, it's not cute. <laughs> Jezebel became symbolic in a name for someone who was wicked, someone who was evil. 
And so when Jesus references here this woman Jezebel, I do believe that there was a member in that church in Thyatira who was secretly and privately promoting heresies that were leading people to moral compromise and sexual exploration. So yes, there is a woman in the church who's doing this, but Jesus calls her, she's Jezebel from of old. Privately and secretly leading God's people away through some sort of uh, heresy that she's dabbling in, in the privacy of the church that is leading, you see it there in the verse, leading and seducing the servants of Jesus to practice sexual immorality. These are God's servants. This isn't happening outside the church. He's saying, all the people in the world who aren't following me, what's wrong with him? He's saying, no, in the church, this is happening. Jezebel herself, whatever her real name is, claimed to be a prophetess, speaking to God's people on behalf of God. Some sort of heresy that she was ringleading and creating a pocket of people in the church dabbling in heresy and sexual immorality. What was the heresy? What was she, what was she potentially promoting? Is sometimes called antinomianism. If you know what that is, that's, that's okay. I'm just going to break it down. It's very simple. Anti meaning without, nomianism meaning law. Without the law. And that is a dangerous heresy that can leak into the church that says, oh, you can follow Jesus, you can do that, uh, but there's no moral code you have to follow. It's just all free. Love, love, free love. No moral code at all. Very dangerous. Uh, and, and so the consequences for her is that she's going to die. She's going to die. You see it in the verse there that, that for some way she was given a, an opportunity to repent, whether that came through John, whether it came through the pastor of Thyatira, we don't know. But whatever it was, she was given an opportunity to change her ways. But she refuses to repent, and so she's going to die. If you look back at the story of Jezebel from Kings, Jezebel, the Queen Jezebel, she died a tragic death. She was thrown out of a window, trampled by horses, and eaten by dogs. This is Jezebel, this woman in the church is doing this. That's her fate. That's where she's going. That, that's what's going to happen to her. She's going to die. And if all of those people with her do not repent, they too will die. And when it says there, those who commit sexual adultery with her and her children, I don't think it's her actual, maybe not everyone was having some sort of that type of you know, relationship with her. It's saying that she was leading people this way. She was having progeny who were doing what she was doing. She was reproducing herself in these types of people. And all of them are going to suffer if they don't repent. The church's growth can be upended by unhealthy growth. It's kind of intense, I know. Maybe you didn't come to church today thinking, oh, I'm going to hear a message about this. <laughs> Sometimes the messages that we need to hear aren't the messages we want to hear. But this is the message God has for us today. And it'd be good for us to listen. I want to apply this for us before we look at verses 24 to 29. Because I think there's some particular applications. So we, we get the interpretation, what's happening, the context. And now we can look at some different applications. First is this. When love is without a center, it can twist into lust without restraint. When love itself loses its center, it can easily twist into lust without restraint. It's that antinomianism thing. Oh yeah, the the priority of love, loving one another, which is truly and, and honestly what we're supposed to be doing. But if it loses its center the way it did in Thyatira, and it can actually do in the contemporary church in 2024, what can easily happen is that we twist into lust without restraint. 
Love is right. Love is good. Love comes from God because God is love, right? We see that in 1 John. God is love. He is the definition of love. But if we look at how God loves, there are things that God does not love. God does not love wickedness and evil and sin. That's why Jesus died. He died for those things. There are things we ought not to love. So yes, the call to love is biblical and it is right. But we also see in passages like 1 John, which I'm going to read for in just a minute, that there are things we ought not to love. We have to keep this in mind. That sometimes our love for God means we won't love certain things. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. Whatever does, the will of God abides forever. It's pretty simple what John is telling us there. We cannot commingle love for God with love for the world. They can't coexist together. There are certain things that we ought not to love. Do not love the world, he says. And then he mentions three of them. Desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. And so as we think about love and having the priority of love in our life, it has to keep centered on God. What what does he love? And make sure our affections are aligned with his affections and the things that he's not affectionate about, we actually don't love. We keep centered because these things don't always mix together. So that's one application of these verses here. The second is this. It's not a direct application of what was going on in the church, but it's certainly important for us to understand is that we have to be careful of toxic pockets within the church that can derail the church. We have to be careful that we don't become part of a small, toxic faction within the church that could potentially derail the whole church. And this can easily happen uh, in the basement of the church, (laughs) a small little room, that this little group of people who meets in their home with no, no accountability, no direction, and they're just going to do whatever they're going to do, and they're just kind of dabbling in theological things and doctrine that are actually going to derail the church. So, friends, we have to be very careful and be on high alert that we don't ap- you know, accidentally and inadvertently get involved with a pocket in the church that is toxic and is going to derail the whole thing. So that's, and that's an application for us. We need to be careful that we don't get sucked into something that we're not even aware it's, where it's going and where it ends up at. So this, we have to be careful of these things. We should test everything we hear against Scripture. You should test what I preach on. You should test what you hear from other preachers. Test what's going on. Listen. Is it in alignment with Scripture? Is it, is it true? Is it right? Is it, is, it, is it narrow? Is it straight? We want to Get the word right so we can give it to each other right. Let's be careful. It's just an application of these verses here. So what are we supposed to do? (laughs) What do we do? Well, we do what Jesus recommended the church in Thyatira. Look at verse 24. Jesus says this to them after this kind of intense moment. Like he's like, you're doing this or it's it's happening in your church. But he says this, but to the rest of you. Isn't that good? He's saying not all of you have gotten pulled into this. It's just a pocket. It's a small group of people. He says, to the rest of you. Ah, that's good. Who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. To you, I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So I think what we do as a healthy church who is growing and progressing and moving forward, we have to stay super focused. I know that's a weird way to say it, but we just have to stay focused. Jesus doesn't say to them, oh, could you stop loving altogether? Okay, you've, gone, you've, you've swung too far on the love channel over here. Like, <laughs> the love boat is, is sailed off. No, he's, keep loving. Hold fast to what you have. Anchor yourself to what you have in verse 19. Anchor yourself to love, to faith, service, to perseverance. Don't settle for the status quo. Keep going deeper. Keep progressing. Keep growing in your spiritual formation. Keep going, he says. But conquer. Conquer the toxicity that can choke out growth by playing the long game. And Jesus describes the long game in a couple different interesting ways. First, he says, there's going to be this co-regency that you have with him in ruling the nations. It's quite mysterious to think about that. But what Jesus is saying is that there will be a time when we rule with him the nations. He says, I've given authority. I'm going to give you authority just as I've received authority from my father. So there will be a time in the long game. When you and I stay faithful to the end until Jesus comes, when we will rule with him. And so we have to play that long game that says, I'm not going to forego that long game just to get a little bit of pleasure today. I'm going to persevere. The second thing, he says, you're going to get this morning star. The long game says, you're going to get something, (laughs) a morning star. It's fascinating imagery, isn't it? The imagery there that Jesus is talking about, he's saying about this is him. He's the morning star. I was getting some random star in the sky. Oh, you have a morning star. It's, it's him. He is the morning star. So he's saying, you hold fast to the end. You conquer. You keep going. Don't get duped. Don't get sucked in. What you're going to get at the end is him. He is the morning star as we rule with him. So be aware. Stay focused. Don't get distracted by the things in this world. They may think, well, is that true? Is that not true? Stay focused. Hold on to what you have. Stay centered on Jesus. Verse 29. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May the Lord open our ears to hear what he says to us. Sometimes we're needing him to unplug our ears so we'll hear his voice. Let us hear what he says. And may our lives align to what he wants for us. Let me pray for us. Respond this morning to the final song together. Do you stand with me as I close this in prayer? Father, it is good for us to sit under your word. It's very easy for us to get off the rails. It's easy to dabble in things that this world approves of, but that you don't approve of. And we are sorry. We ask that you'd forgive us for those areas that were becoming soft on doctrine, soft on truth. Father, we want you more than anything. And we need you more than anything. And so for this church, for Longmont Calvary, planted here I pray that you'd help us to listen well to what you want to say to us and so Father we pray that you would give us a heart of repentance thank you for your grace that is sufficient for us when we fail, when we mess it up every single one of us in this room has at one point screwed it up 
gotten off track. And so we thank you for your grace that pulls us back. That pursuing grace that will not let us go. Soften our hearts. Give us a heart of repentance. And we thank you that you meet us in those spaces. Father, for anyone here who is living a life that is, they got this area of their life where it's just kind of walled off, it's kind of compartmentalized. I pray that the light of Christ would shine in those areas. And you'd help us to run to the light and not recede back into the darkness. Your light calls us out of darkness. It's your kindness to us. It's your grace that you don't say, well, you did that and I don't care. You call us out. Help us not to be afraid of the light, but to run to it. Thank you for your presence here this morning. By your spirit, we submit ourselves wholly to you. In Jesus' name, amen.